Hi, this is Dennis Consorti with PolitiPeeps, and we are here today with Dr. Mary Ruart. How are you, doctor? I'm great, thanks. Wonderful. Now, you're down in Texas. What's that like? Uh, it's warm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit chillier up here in New York. But in terms of temperature, the political climate up here is vastly different. I'm in a very blue state. Uh, how would you describe life for a libertarian in Texas? We've been very successful in Texas. I think we have the largest state party at this point in time. We've, I think, run more candidates in the last couple elections than the other states have. But we're having to fight the state because they're so upset with our success that they have instituted huge filing fees for us. Uh, we went to court and we got an injunction against that. So that case won't be heard until after the next series of elections, probably. Wow. Yeah, we've had similar problems up here in New York with ballot access where they're talking about raising the minimum requirements. How would you describe your brand of libertarianism? Well, I don't know that I have a brand per se. I mean, libertarianism is the embracing of the non-aggression principle, which states that we don't initiate physical force, fraud, or theft against others. And if we do for some reason, accidentally or on purpose, uh, you know, then we restore our victim. And that's a really important point because um, a lot of people think the non-aggression principle, for example, means no self-defense, but that's not true. We defend against initiation of force. And also it's important to understand that restitution is sort of the second part of the non-aggression principle, at least in my mind, because it, it guides us in telling us when aggression might or initiation of force might be acceptable. For example, if you and I are standing on the sidewalk and I'm watching my phone and not paying attention to traffic and I step out and you pull me back, <laughs> you're initiating force against me. But I'm certainly not going to ask for restitution. I'm going to be thanking you. <laughs> so that's why it's an important part of the non-aggression principle. It shows us when initiation of force is acceptable. Yeah, that sounds good to me, of course, being a libertarian also. How do people respond to your description of the non-aggression principle down in Texas? Well, generally speaking, all over the world, I think if people are leaning towards a peaceful and prosperous world, they immediately see that the non-aggression principle is something that they embrace already in their personal life. You know, when I go into the classroom to talk about libertarianism, what I do is I put on the board three political philosophies. One is the majority should rule the minority. The minority should rule the majority. Or everyone should rule themselves as long as they don't initiate physical force, fraud, or theft against others. And I ask the students to vote. I haven't said anything at this point about what libertarianism is. And usually when I say, uh, when I ask them to vote, uh, some will vote for the majority should rule the minority. But that's rare. I'd say maybe 2% of the students. Most of them vote for the non-aggression principle because they recognize it as something they do when they interact with their neighbors or their classmates. And then, of course, I ask them how they think the U.S. government in particular uh, operates today. And it's very interesting because none of them choose the non-aggression principle. <laughs> and most of them choose the majority rules the minority, but a lot of them choose the minority rules the majority. So it's very interesting. Students, even in high school, already understand that the non-aggression principle is the way to live and it's something they practice and have learned as children. But they also recognize that our government does not act that way. Yeah, and that sounds like a very practical way to explain the non-aggression principle. Is that the framework you used when you ran for president in 2008 as a libertarian? No, I use a different, you know, with people who are already acquainted with the libertarian philosophy, they're already embracing the non-aggression principle. And so I, I don't use that approach. Uh, what I do do is I try to explain the practical implications of liberty, because that's something that was missing in the first years of the party. We just didn't have all the studies and things that we have today to show that liberty works in the real world. And now we have hundreds and thousands, really, of examples of how that happens. So I'll try in this interview, and I try when I talk to a libertarian audience to emphasize that liberty works. Yeah, I actually think that 
the biggest challenge we have is in how we communicate these principles to others. Uh, but that's a subject for another time. Now, in the current election, we hear a lot about there being a first woman president. And of course, libertarians came to this party long before the Democrats or Republicans ever did. How did gender play a role in your candidacy? I'm not sure that it did necessarily. Um, I ran, now I have to admit, in 1983, my first Libertarian Party convention, I was young and naive, and I thought that the reason we didn't get much publicity was because we weren't interesting enough to the news. So what I wanted to do in 1983 is propose that in 19, uh, well, that, that was that was our presidential convention for the 1984 nomination. And I wanted to propose in, uh, for 1998 that we put a woman at the top of our ticket, which it would have been unique and I thought would gain us some, some notoriety in the press. But I was told uh, at the Texas, I was living in Michigan at the time, but I went to the Texas cocktail party and they told me, that the only way I could get that message out would be to run for president. So in 1983, the person who suggested this, Roger Gary of Texas uh, and myself, decided we would do that. And, and I was taken seriously, which surprised me. All I was doing is trying to create a platform for this idea. And so we had uh, two front runners who were both men and myself, uh, just trying to suggest that we run a woman, but because people really liked me, I had 20% of the votes and each of them had 40%. So it was interesting. I got to see things that the average libertarian doesn't see. And unfortunately, uh, we are prone to politics too. And that, that was a surprise to me. I thought maybe we were above that, but not so. <laughs> yeah, it, it happens. Now, politics play a role in our lives every day in addition to in this political arena. How does politics play a role in, in your life? You mentioned that you have students. Can you tell me about that? Well, I have, well, when I ran for office in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where I was for 20 years, I ran as a, a candidate for state house rep. And a lot of the teachers in both colleges and in high schools brought in all of the candidates. And they liked me so much that they invited me to give a lecture on libertarianism for either every year or every quarter of their students, depending on how their classes were shaped. So for about 10 years, I went into classrooms in Kalamazoo and, and had a basically a 40 or 50 minute period to talk about libertarianism. And so I would talk about it just as I told you and uh, put out a few facts and figures and then open for discussion and we had some pretty rousing discussions. Yeah, that sounds great. I also speak at different universities and I don't talk about libertarianism, but I do bring principles of liberty to my talks. I, I speak about digital marketing and um, how to communicate with different audiences mm -hmm. and I'm able to weave in these principles without being political. And that enables me to get invited back to these institutions that would otherwise disagree with me. Ah, very good, very good. Yeah, I try. And I think we can all try in small ways to spread liberty. In your way, you've written some books. Can you tell us a bit about them? Yes, Healing Our World was my first book. It was first put out in 1992. The latest edition, the fourth edition, was 2015. And I changed the subtitle each time. So the 2015 edition is Healing Our World, The Compassion of Libertarianism. And that's, you know, something that has tried to address, well, in the first edition at least, and, and subsequent editions, of course, too. I was trying to explain the libertarian philosophy to people that the libertarians generally aren't very good at communicating with. <laughs> um, Christians, New Agers, environmentalists, liberals, and pragmatists. And Healing Our World probably has more examples of how liberty works in real life than any other book to date that I've seen. So that's one thing I'm, I'm very happy with. And people have given the book as gifts to friends and family. In fact, for every book I sell a libertarian, I sell another one that they use as a gift. And so that's really how the distribution has come about. And then, of course, I have a, another book. 
Yeah, it's exciting for me as an author. So um, the second book was Short Answers to the Tough Questions. It's based on a column I wrote for the Advocates for Self-Government for 20 years. And basically, I was trying to show libertarians how to get their point across in a very brief a segment of time, because if you're a candidate, you have to be very brief. And if you are trying to explain to friends and family, they aren't going to listen for two hours. You, know, you really have to catch their attention. And so I was trying to, in my column and then in the compilation, I was trying to show ways to do that. And then my latest book, Death by Regulation, which came out last year, the, the full title is Death by Regulation, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It, talks about the behind-the-scenes work that the FDA does to really make drugs unaffordable. Um, most of the high drug prices that we talk about and complain about <laughs> are due to the increasing costs, the exponentially increasing costs of meeting FDA regulations to get a drug approval. And I was able to write this book because I was with the Upjohn Company for 19 years and I had interactions with the FDA and of course saw how, how this all impacted the process of getting a drug from the lab bench to the marketplace. And in particular, I talk about the 1962 regulations, which changed the industry so much that what used to take four years to take a drug from the lab bench to the market has now become 14 years, and a lot of people die waiting. In that book, I estimate that each of us have lost five to 10 years off our lives because of these regulations. And the reason I'm able to make that calculation is there's been so many studies about the pharmaceutical industry. I just have to take other published work and, and make the calculation. That sounds like a serious body of work, and I can only imagine how much time it took you to put together. Now that death by regulation is complete, how do you spend your time? Well, I'm taking a little time off from writing books <laughs> because uh, I did the uh, last edition of Healing Our World and Death by Regulation back to back, and to do those books, I really kind of go into cloister so that uh, you know I get to the point where I have to get out again, <laughs> and I'm in that phase now. Wonderful. Good for you. We all deserve a break. So we're going to get into a couple more segments with Dr. Ruar, but in the meantime, how do people find you online? Well, I have a website, ruart.com. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And if you go to my website, ruart.com, that's R U w a r t dot com just like my last name then you can actually go to the lower right hand corner of the page and click on the links to all of that uh, social media all right sounds great i'm going to put links to those places in the description of this video in the meantime this is dennis with politipeeps don't forget to like share and subscribe